Good afternoon, my beautiful babes and babas. I am your resident active advocate, and be forewarned, this video is basically just about imprinting. I'm going to be talking about this phenomenon, both in the context of the book and in the context of the real world. So for those of you who don't know, in the real world, okay, imprinting is a thing that is done by what you might consider lower order animals. Namely, this is done with birds and specifically with ducklings, right? Uh, imprinting itself though, is not as portrayed in these books, a romantic attachment. Imprinting is meant to be a survival tactic between the baby and the mother. The baby imprints on the mother, so it knows at all times which of the birds around it is its mother and therefore who to follow in order to find food. Very important concept here, okay? This does not transcend to what you would call higher order animals, namely wolves. This does not exist in wolves, okay? As I say, mostly this is a bird thing. I did read one article that said it could also occur in guinea pigs, but then I found contradictory information that said it only occurs in birds, so therefore not in mammals. In these books, however, and you get into this concept in Eclipse, not really before then, in these books, however, imprinting is portrayed as a I'm not even going to call it romantic if I can avoid it, avoid it as a pseudo romantic relationship. And what happens is that everyone in the wolf pack or the shapeshifter pack is male except one. We'll talk about her in the Breaking Dawn episodes, but every male wolf in the pack has the potential to imprint on someone. Um, this being their future partner in life. Um, they are not able to control who they imprint on. This is actually true with the real world phenomenon because generally a bird will imprint on, theoretically it's going to be the mother, but on the first thing they see move, okay? Usually this is the mother, but there have been cases, there have been actual studies done of scientists rolling a ball into the birthing area when the, uh, when the hatchling is coming out of the egg and the duck will imprint on the ball and mistake it for its mother. I think that this is quite cruel, unfortunately, because it will start following the ball around. And that is like, that would not be cohesive to their survival instinct. In the books though, just as with the baby, uh, the baby ducklings, um, the male wolves do not have the capacity to control who they imprint on. And it can occur between two people of consenting age, or in the case of one of the pack members, it can, content warning, it can even occur with people as young as two years old. Um, one of the pack members, Quill, imprints on a two-year-old girl named Claire. All right, and the whole idea again, content warning, is that the imprintee will really have no choice but to fall in love with the imprinter because it becomes part of the imprinter's like DNA motivated life to be with this person at all costs and to be for them anything they need at the time. Almost every single time, at least it's implied, that this will evolve into a romantic relationship, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. In the case of Quill and Claire, it's not a romantic relationship, but that is the way in which he and consequently the rest of the pack see it evolving. 
he starts off as more of an older brother figure to her. And the whole problem that I have with this and that anyone who has read these books and does not like this concept has with this is that this is an example of social grooming. And basically the idea is that I will help to raise this child and then I will also marry this child. This is grooming, okay? Um, the definition of grooming is that you take under your wing the person with whom you intend to have romantic relations, but you do so long beforehand in order to make them into what you want them to be. In theory, however, in this case, it's supposed to be the other way around. The girl makes the boy into whatever she needs him to be. Jacob explains this to Bella in such a way as he says, in any given stage of life, the imprinter will be to the imprintee whatever she needs him to be, be it a brother, be it a best friend, be it a romantic partner, all right? I have several real world issues with this concept. The foremost of which is the incredibly racist notion on which this is all based, which is that because this only occurs with the Quileute males, um, the concept is that, and this comes from colonial times, Indigenous men are not able to control their sex, their sexual drives, all right? And you see this in many narrations done from the colonialist point of view, where people from Indigenous bands and nations would run off with our women. Oh, oftentimes it was the other way around, actually. And the whole idea is once again, the us versus them narrative and the whole idea of they treat women like property, not like us good civilized whites. They treat women like possessions and like things just to be acquired in order to satisfy the sexual urge, unlike us good whites. We treat them with respect and with manners. We give them dignity. We give them a home. Here's the thing, though, that these colonists didn't care to consider is that most, as far as I'm aware, most indigenous nations are actually matriarchal, okay? That means that the female figure is in charge, not the male figure. Yes, you will get male chiefs who will, at least nominally, be in charge of the tribe, or not the tribe, I'm sorry, the band or the nation, but... Their consultant, i.e. the one actually making the decisions, will be an elder female, okay? When I say the word elder in this case, I actually mean older person. I don't mean elder in the colonialist sense. I want to get to that too, because Bella calls Jacob, at least in the movie, Chief Jacob, because he has, of all of the members of the wolf pack, he has the purest blood going back to the common ancestor of all of these wolves. And the man's name was Ephraim Black. He was Jacob's great-grandfather, I believe. Um, theoretically, every Quileute male has the capacity to become a shapeshifter, but Ephraim was a direct descendant of the first people to be able to take the transformation, who in the book are called Tahaaki and Kahilaha, okay? So Kahilaha was a descendant of Tahaaki, who was the first one. But Jacob being in a direct line of descent from him is said to be the most genetically pure when it comes to the transformation, and therefore the one who ought to be in charge. This, however, is a colonialist notion of how chiefdom works and of how even the elder system works, okay? In the real world, I don't know whether this transcends nations, but what I have heard is that in the real world, beside the colonialist narrative, is the real one that says, <clears throat> your elder is personal to you. You, as the younger person, choose your own elder, okay? 
they are not, as the colonialists put it, they're not necessarily community leaders, they are personal leaders. Your elder, therefore, can be a mentor, can be a teacher, can be one of your parents, you know, an aunt, an uncle, that kind of thing. And it could be male person, female person, you know, um, anyone that you choose out of a sign of respect. And I do believe you can have more than one elder. Um, but the colonialist notion is that which follows the system of monarchy that says that elders as a collective are community leaders. But I mean, the colonialists saw coming over here that the North American bands and nations were much more collectivist than the European nations who came over to colonize. And that's where the whole idea of the elder system came from. Generally, they would see a body of older people leading the community and say, oh, they must be just like us. You know, they must be, they must have their, their chief, i.e. king. They must have their mayors, i.e. council members, that sort of thing. And while that system was adopted, I think it may have been adopted post-colonial, so post-1400s. Like, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? He landed in South America, but his legacy went all the way up to North America, of course. Um, and you see that with the conquistadors, you see that with the English and the French and the Portuguese coming to these continents. And a lot of the time just flat out slaughtering the indigenous peoples here, um, but in the North American context, much of the time also attempting to re-educate them, re-educate them um, to be proper civilized white, well, pseudo-white people. Remember, you'll never be accepted into white culture if you have brown skin, okay? This is a time-honored, and in my case, time-loathed, tradition of white colonialism. If you don't look like us, if you don't come from where we come from, you're not going to be one of us ever, no matter how much you act like it. Uh, I really don't like that. And the fact that Stephanie Meyer plugs the entire, uh, the entire Quileute tribe, not tribe, I'm sorry, band, nation, into the narrative, into the colonialist narrative of A, the system of hierarchy must be genetic because that is how we got it from the white context. You know, the king was always determined by their genealogical line. And B, sorry for this one again, that indigenous males cannot control their sex drive. I don't like this. I think it is just stunningly racist. Literally the only good thing to come out of this ever is that Stephanie Meyer bringing attention to the Quileute Nation brought tourism to them, therefore helps them somewhat monetarily. They did not, by the way, as a band, as a nation, see any money from the actual books and movies but they did see it in terms of tourism from people who wanted to learn more about the real cultural context coming out of real life. And primarily, those are my issues, not with Jacob, but with Stephanie Meyer in this book. Jacob, as you might know, does imprint in Breaking Dawn. We will talk about that in Breaking Dawn. Okay, because it's just an extension of what happens with Quill and Claire, and I really don't like it, and I want to probably make that its own video, um, because there are a lot of other Jacob issues in Breaking Dawn that have to do with Jacob himself. Um, but another thing, by the way, before I forget, is I want to point out the startling contrast between Jacob in New Moon versus Jacob in Eclipse, okay? I have read both books. I have watched both movies at this point. Ow. Suffering. The suffering. It doesn't end. But in New Moon, while the relationship between Jacob and Bella, as I have said, is codependent, he is much more supportive. He is a good friend to her. He is kind to her. He lets her cry on his shoulder, figuratively speaking, when she is pining over Edward and assures her, I will never leave you. I will always be here for you. 
Whereas in Eclipse, it's framed as it being because Edward came back, but not even because when Bella runs off into Quilliet territory, into La Push, and Jacob, you know, has her over, he tries to force kisses on her. He tries to force her to, uh, to be a romantic partner with him, not just a friend. He never tried that in New Moon. And my running theory behind this is Stephanie Meyer, this is just my theory, okay? Stephanie Meyer wanted to make Jacob seem the worst of the two options in order to justify Bella going off with stalker, house arrest, codependent Edward. Um, because that's the way her narrative needed to go. Because Jacob is indigenous, Edward is white. All right, I'm just, I'm putting my, I'm putting my piece out there, okay? Um, I'm not saying it's because Stephanie Meyer is a Mormon that she's doing this, but I don't know whether this is still a teaching in Mormonism, but it was believed, at least in the past, that if black and indigenous people on these continents converted into being Mormons, their skin would turn white. And, oh my god, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I cringe at that. I cringe at that teaching. And as I say, I don't know whether that is still a teaching. For the love of everything that is holy, I hope not. Um, because A, it didn't work, obviously, and B, it is just, as I say, it is stunningly racist. Like, come on, people, we can do better than this, okay? And how these books were greenlit in the 21st century is beyond me. It is utterly beyond me. Um, and again, with the movies, my usual complaint Put on shirts, guys. I know you own them. Right? So, yeah. Basically, those are my Jacob issues for this um, book slash movie. And most of them don't have to do with Jacob. Which is interesting, actually, because Jacob is becoming less of a character and more of a plot device. That happens to a lot of characters in this book. And we will talk... In the next series on Breaking Dawn, which I will start on Monday because I talk I take weekends off, we will talk about the ultimate plot device who is coming our way, and it it's actually going to be kind of interesting. But content warnings abound for my upcoming content. Oh my gosh, um, yeah, fun. All right, so I'll see you all on Monday. Have a lovely, wonderful weekend, and I get to dog sit from my sister. Woohoo! Mwah.